Those are the parts you need to protect. And the Bible says it's not just anybody armor. It's not just anyone's breastplate. It is God's. God gave it to you. It is God's protection. It's not the breastplate in itself. It's not the body armor in itself. It is because it's from God. It is God who protects. You need to put it on, but in the same time you realize that I fully depend on God to protect me. Amen. There is a way I need to walk. I need to walk in the truth. There is a breastplate that is called righteousness. And it's God's righteousness because there are two kinds of righteousness. We will get into that. But there are two kinds of righteousness. You need that body armor. You need that breastplate. Why? Because the heart, the Bible says, out of the heart spring forth the issues of life. It means, the New Living Translation says, it determines the course of your life. Mm -hmm. What direction you will take depends on what lives inside of your heart. Amen. If you know that there are different roads that you can choose from, when it is the Holy Spirit that lives in your heart, you will take the road that is God's road. Amen. It's His way. You will not take a road that looks similar. You will not take a road that is parallel to the road that God wants you to take. Because although it may lead you in the same direction, the destination will be different. Mm -hmm. You see, you can take two parallel roads, but the destination in the end is different. Amen. Because you can't see the end of the road. It may look like, oh, I'm, I'm going the right way, I'm going the right way. But all of a sudden, the road turns. And you need to go left, but the road that you're on turns to the right. You didn't see it at first, but all of a sudden it makes a turn and you realize, wait a minute, how do I get there? Because that's where I wanted to go. And then you realize the only way to do that is go all the way back. <coughs> and you have to start over again. And that is such a waste of time and it causes a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. So that's why the Bible says, guard your heart above all else. How? By the body armor. The breastplate of righteousness. It is righteousness. Righteousness means you can stand right before God. Amen. Isn't that something to Amen. say? Amen. That you wake up in the morning, that you look at yourself in the mirror, and you can say, I know I can stand right before God. Amen. That is amazing if you can say that. The only way you can say that you can stand right before God is knowing that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. That you have been forgiven of your sins. That it is the blood of Jesus that washed you clean. That is when you can say with all of your heart, no shadow of a doubt, I can stand right before God. Knowing that God is holy. Amen. Amen. In His presence there can be no sin. When all the sin of the world was laid upon Jesus when He died on the cross, what did the Father do? What did the Father do? He turned away. He looked the other way. There is no good Father that will ever look away from his son. When you see your son in pain, you see the agony on his face, oh! But God the Father looked away. Why? Because sin was laid upon Jesus. Sin was laid upon Jesus. Sin causes that you cannot stand right before God. But the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness makes you say, I can stand right before God. God who is holy, 
He looks at me, and there's no condemnation for me because I've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Hmm. When you look at your life, when you look at your past, you know there are many things that we have done wrong. When I look back at my life, I can... I can write down a list of things that I've done wrong. All sinful things. And I know that each and every one of those things have been forgiven. Amen. But they're not erased from my memory. I know I'm forgiven, but they're still in my memory. And because they're still in my memory, it means that they can resurface, they can be found, I can find them. If I go back in my mind, I can go to those moments that I failed God, the bad things that I've done. I don't like to go there. I don't want to go there. I don't go there. Because I know I'm forgiven. I praise God. But the Bible also teaches us that there is an accuser of the brethren. There's an accuser. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Amen. The devil is the accuser. And he always comes. And the only thing he can accuse us of are the things that we have done wrong in the past. Things that you know of, I'm forgiven. The blood of Jesus took care of that. But those moments that you feel weak, those moments that you feel tired, those moments that you feel frustrated... Those moments that you don't feel well, you don't feel happy, it's in those moments the accuser comes and he says, you know why this happens to you? It's because of what you've done and this and this and this and this. And he starts to call out these things. And the thing with the devil is he's a liar. But the devil will not just come with a straightforward lie. That you, that you know, I mean, he will not say to you, you have done this, while you know you haven't done that. Because then it's easy. You can say, what are you talking about? I've never done that. You drove through that red light. I've never been in that place. What are you talking about? You know, things like that. He will not tell you something you didn't do. He will use the things that you did do and then present them as if they still have power over you, as if they are still active and have power to condemn you. And if you don't wear the breastplate, the body armor of righteousness, righteousness meaning you can stand right before God knowing that you are forgiven, if you don't hold on to the knowledge and the truth that you are forgiven, you will start to think about what he's saying. He will use a truth and present it as something that still has power. While you know it doesn't have power anymore. God already forgave me. And this is how you protect your heart. Because the moment you start to think about it, it goes from here to there in an instant. It starts to affect your mood it starts to affect how you speak because the moment it, it reaches your heart out of the heart flows everything you say everything you say all of a sudden you start speaking negative all of a sudden you start to realize yeah yeah I've done these things wrong and that's why I'm in this problem that's why I have this situation that's why I God cannot hear me. That's why God doesn't provide for me. That's why God, that's why God, that's why God. And I know what I'm talking about. There have been moments in my life 
that I said to myself, it's all over. It's all over. Ministry, it's gone. It's gone. I know what I've done. I know the things that have happened. But my life was completely turned upside down. And everything I had fell to pieces. The accuser came. And he came in a way I didn't expect him to come. I can guarantee you one thing. He will come. He will come. And he may come in an unexpected way, but he will come. When everything fell to pieces in my life, and I cried out to God, and I wrestled with God, and I, I, I used every knowledge I have of the Word of God. How to pray, how to worship, how to, to cry out, how to go on your knees. And it is hard when you're in, in darkness to hear the voice of God. When there's a lot of noise around you, it's hard. It's hard. Because when the Bible says he, spe he speaks with a still, small voice, mm -hmm. it is hard to hear that still, small voice when there's a lot of noise around yeah, you. It's true. Come in. It's true. I remember what happened one day. As I said, my life fell to pieces. Everything I had crumbled to pieces, mm -hmm. lost it. And I was in darkness. Darkness was around me. Darkness wasn't inside of me. There's a difference there. Darkness was around me. And I was fighting, and I was battling, and I was praying. You know this device is really nice every now and then? But sometimes I really hate it. I really hate it. There was one person... I didn't even realize that person had my number. I know the person from many years ago when I made a house call. I entered into the house, and before I entered into the house, when I don't know a person that well, I always cover myself with the blood of Jesus before I enter someone's house, especially if I don't know them. So I covered myself with the blood of Jesus and I entered the house and we got to talk. And from the moment I stepped in, I just realized, oh my goodness, there's a lot of spiritual activity going on in this house. This is not good. That person, there was, there were a lot of evil spirits there, let me just say it like that. After I left, I prayed God, cleansed myself with the blood of Jesus. Never spoke to that person for years. Person came to church for, for a period of time, left the church. I moved on. Years after that, when I was at my darkest moment, I received a text message. Nobody knew except for a very small circle of people, what exactly was going on in my life. I mean, talking about details. And you will notice that I'm not sharing any details right now. Because they're of no use. Very few people knew the details. And that person didn't know anything. But the text I received was so specific, into detail, and it was an accusation. I said to myself, if no person on earth would know the details of the things that I'm going through right now, there are always two that know. God knows, the devil knows. And this message, I know exactly where it comes from. What I'm trying to say is, the devil will find a way. He knows. 
He knows more than you and I know. But you need to remind him of some things he also knows. But he refuses to acknowledge. He may know your past. He may know your dark periods. He may know the things that you have done that you're ashamed about. And like me, you don't share the details. <laughs> he may know all these things. But you need to remind him of what you also know about him. Mm -hmm. What you know about him is that his power was defeated when Jesus died on the cross. Amen. What you know is that when Jesus rose again from the dead, death was completely defeated. Amen. What you know is that Jesus disarmed all the powers and principalities and openly displayed them and had victory and Amen. still has victory over Amen. them. Hallelujah. What you know is that all the accusations against you that were written down, the Bible says they were nailed to the cross Amen. and they were dealt with. Amen. All of them. Past, present, and future. All of them are dealt with. Amen. What you know is that Satan may still have power on earth, but his time is limited and he, his end is determined. It has already been determined what will happen to him. He will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's it. That's it. So when he comes to accuse you of things that you have done, all you need to say is, yes, I have done these things, but the blood of Jesus took care of it. My name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. With Jesus Christ I live. I no longer live in my old life, my sinful life. I have received new life in Christ. And that life makes me stand righteous before my God. That is what you know. That is what you may not feel every second of the day. But that is what you know because the Bible says so. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God be true. And that is your protection. That is your armor. The righteousness you have received through Christ. Sin is an awful thing. Paul speaks to the Corinthians. He warns them. He says, awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says this to the church. He says it to the believers. Not to those who don't know Jesus. He says this to those that know Jesus. New Living Translation says, Think carefully about what is right. Amen. Stop sinning. Mm -hmm. Stop sinning. Good job. Stop. <laughs> for, for to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. Ooh, hallelujah. Very powerful one. <laughs> Now you might say, praise God, I'm not a Corinthian. <laughs> but he speaks into the church. And the letter he wrote to the Corinthians traveled to the other places. And the people in Philippi, when they heard the letter that was written to the Corinthians, they couldn't say, oh, praise God, that's just for this in Corinth. I live in Philippi. It doesn't work like that. This is the Word of God. And the Word of God speaks to us. And He says, listen, if you say that you're a child of God, but you live consciously in sin, you don't know God. Because if you would know God, you would realize that your sin causes God to turn His face from you. Amen. Moses wrote down the blessing that he spoke about God's people. Make his face shine upon you. Yes. May his countenance be towards you. His face cannot shine upon us when we live in sin. Not just when you commit a sin. 
that's different. You can walk in the ways of the Lord, and there are moments that you're weak and you fall. And you, you, you commit a sin. And the moment you commit a sin, you know in your heart, oh, oh Lord, I failed you. Oh Lord, forgive me. Lord, wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. Lord, give me strength to not fall into that sin anymore. I don't want that. That's different. But when you live in sin, it means you do something that you know that is against what God wants you to do. And the moment you do it, you don't really repent from it. You feel sorry, you feel bad, you ask forgiveness, but you do it again. And you do it again. And you keep doing it. That's when you live in sin. When you live in sin, you cannot please God. Sin is the greatest enemy to mm. that stands against the righteousness that you have received in Christ. And righteousness is your body armor. Mm. It protects your heart. Amen. If your body armor, if your life is full of sin, mm. you, you don't wear the breastplate of righteousness. No. You wear a breastplate, but not the one of righteousness. Mm. I said there are two kinds of righteousness. Mm. There is the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus, that is through the blood that we will, we will celebrate communion. That is what we celebrate. That we have been made righteous with God through Jesus. And there's the self-righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. And that also looks nice. You wear a body armor and it's shiny and it's good and it's wow, look at the body armor. Look inside. You know what the Bible calls it? Isaiah 64, 6. We are all infected and impure with sin. You know, the sinful life. When we display our righteous deeds, wait a minute. You live a sinful life, but from the sinful life you can display righteous deeds. That is that group that believes that you will be saved by doing good things. You're not saved by doing good things. When we display our righteous deeds, listen, they are nothing but filthy rags. That's what the Bible says. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So you're when, when you live like that, in self-righteousness, you do good things, and the good things are, are noticed by people. Mm. And they look at it and say, oh, good mm. deeds, good deeds. Mm. Oh, good, 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 good. You Two already. thumbs up, good, good. <laughs> but God looks at it and says, the armor that you're wearing is filthy rags. Have you ever seen a soldier going to war with filthy rags? No. If you would see someone on the street wearing filthy rags, pretending like it's the most beautiful clothes that you can ever oh, buy, Jesus. you would call them what? Hypocrites. You're crazy. Yes. <laughs> Those are not beautiful clothes, they're filthy rags. How dare you call my clothes filthy rags? They're beautiful. They're proud of their good works. But the Bible says God says they're filthy rags. That's right. And you wear them like a body armor. Ooh. Now, filthy rags, when it's actually filthy rags, you can just recognize them. Ooh. But filthy rags are disguised as good deeds, so it looks nice, it looks shiny, it looks beautiful. Ooh. You know who did that? King Ahab. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know King Ahab? Yeah. Yes. The Bible says about King Ahab that his life was a mess. In 1 Kings 16 verse 30 it says, Ahab the son of Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight even more than any of the kings before him. That's who King Ahab was. What kind of evil things did he do? Well, he married Jezebel. Who brought Baal, the idols, into the country. And she led the whole nation into idol worship. And the king said, go ahead. I'll go with you. I'll bow before that king. I'll bow before God. I'll bow before whoever you want me to bow for. 
He was not the priest of his house. He was not the king of his nation. <laughs> Another thing he did was he looked outside his window and said, Ooh, that's a beautiful thing. Neighbor, right? neighbor. Hmm. Neighbor, Who is the owner of that? Neighbor. Neighbor. Ooh. Neighbor. Ooh. Good man. I want your vineyard. Yeah. Oh. Neighbor yeah. said, Sorry, yeah. my king. Yeah. It's not for sale. Not for sale. <laughs> I'll give you so much money. You yeah. can give me all the money in the world, but it's not for sale. Yeah. So he was frustrated. He went home. He started prowling like a small kid. Yeah. His wife came and said, Why are you prowling? Yeah. He said, My neighbor won't yeah. sell his vineyard to me. Yeah. She said, Are you a king or what? Yeah. You have the power to kill him. Kill him. Yeah. So he killed his neighbor and took his vineyard. Yeah. Oh, he, he killed a person just to get a vineyard. That is the kind of man he was. Mm. And then, one day, he received a visitor, King Jehoshaphat from Judah. King Jehoshaphat loved the Lord, walked with the Lord. The only thing he did was, and he shouldn't have done, he connected with the king of Israel, who was the worst king ever. But he came to visit, and King Ahab said, You know, there's this part of the country, and the Arameans have took it from. But it's actually ours. And we never really spend time to get it back. So I think I want it back. But I don't just want to go along with my army. Why don't you join me, Jehoshaphat? Join me with your army. And Jehoshaphat said, Yeah, yeah sure. Sure, why not? But then, because Jehoshaphat feared the Lord, he said, but before we go, let's inquire from the Lord what he wants us to do. So Ahab called all the priests, and the priest said, yeah, sure, go ahead, go ahead. God will give you victory. So Jehoshaphat listened to it. But something inside of him, oh, that sweet Holy Spirit, something inside of him said, is there another prophet? So he said, Ahab, isn't there another prophet of the Lord that we can ask? And Ahab said, yeah, there's this one, Micaiah. I don't like him. Because everything he says, he speaks against me. I don't like him. Well, let's call him anyway. Okay, let's call Micaiah. Micaiah King. And before he entered the room, they said, listen, all the other prophets have said that the king should go and he will have victory. So you just say the same. Huh? And Micaiah said, I will only speak that what the Lord wants me to speak. So he entered in. And they have said, okay, we want to go to war. What does the Lord say we should do? And the Bible says, sarcastically, Micaiah said, sure, go ahead. You will have victory. And Ahab felt that he was being mocked. And he said, haven't I commanded you to always speak the truth to me? So Micaiah said, okay, you want the truth? I had a vision. And I saw the people of Israel scattered. And they were scattered because the king was dead. And then Ahab turned to Jehoshaphat and said, Haven't I told you who always speaks negative about me? <laughs> this is what was going on. He knew this was the word from the Lord. And Micaiah said, If this is not the word from the Lord, God may do to me whatever he wants to do to me. But I tell you this, the Lord came to me. And he spoke to me. And he said, I will send forth the spirit. A lying spirit. A lying spirit that will make all the other prophets speak lies. So all the other prophets got angry at Micaiah. But King Ahab decided, okay. But I want to go anyway. So let's draw up a plan. That we can fool God. <laughs> and this was his plan. 1 Kings 22, verse 30. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, As we go into battle, I will disguise myself. So no one will recognize me. 
But you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went into battle. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had issued these orders to his 32 chariot commanders. Attack only the king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. So when the Aramean chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes, they went after him. There's the king of Israel, they shouted. But when Jehoshaphat called out, the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel. And they stopped chasing him. An Aramean soldier randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops and hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Oh, Jesus. Turn the horses and get me out of here. They have grown to the driver of his chariot. I'm badly wounded. The battle raged all that day, and the king remained propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. The blood from his wound ran down to the floor of his chariot, and as evening arrived, he died. He wore his armor. It was shining. For the people, he was disguised, but he still wore his armor. But his armor was filthy now, because his life was a life of sin. God saved Jehoshaphat, who was wearing his royal robes, because he was living righteous before God. And the king of Israel, who thought he was saved by disguising, by pretending, by doing whatever he did, got killed by a random fire arrow. There comes a point in life where all the good deeds will just be tested by fire and nothing will be left of you. Amen. And whatever armor you're wearing, if it's not the armor of righteousness, if it's not the breastplate of righteousness, it will not protect. Repent. It will not protect. The breastplate of righteousness is the only thing that protects one's heart. The only thing that protects your heart, the breastplate of righteousness, is by faith. Mm. Faith in the blood of Jesus. Faith in the cross. That is what protects your heart. It's the only thing that protects your heart. Jeremiah 23 says, this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is my righteousness. He protects me. How do you wear that breastplate and never take it off? How do you do that? I love it what the Bible says about Abraham. In Romans 4, 3 and in Genesis 15, 6, it says the same thing. Scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. It was because of faith that Abraham was called righteous. And he wasn't called righteous by men. He was called righteous by God. God declared him righteous because of his faith. If man declares you righteous, it doesn't mean anything. The only thing that matters is that God calls you righteous. That's why it's God's breastplate of righteousness. It's his Righteousness. I have been made righteous because I put my trust in the word of God. Because I believe the blood of Jesus washed me clean. Because I believe in the cross that is powerful and that is the place of forgiveness. I'm declared righteous because of my faith. When God said to Abraham, I declare you righteous because of your faith. What exactly... How did Abram show that he believed God? Well, Abram listened to God and he did exactly what God said. 
When Abram decided to leave his country and move somewhere else, it, not, it wasn't because he didn't like his country. It wasn't because he received a brochure of another country and said, Oh, that looks so beautiful, I want to go there. It was because God said, Leave your country, and I will take you to a country that I will give to you and your descendants. His journey was not his own invention. It was because God told him. And Abram listened. He didn't walk to Mount Horeb to sacrifice Isaac just because he didn't like his son. Or it because it was a custom of surrounding nations to sacrifice your child. That's not why he went. He went there because God spoke to him. And he obeyed God because he knew that it was God. That's why he went. Faith is always the key. That's why when you read about the breastplate of righteousness, Thessalonians, Paul calls it, let us who are of the day be sober. Are you of the day? Amen. Amen. Or are you of the night? The day meaning you walk in the light. The light of God. The night you mean you walk in darkness, you walk in sin. Those who are of the day, let them be sober. Mm. Mm. Have a clear mind. Clear understanding. See what's going on. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. The same Paul who was inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote down the breastplate of righteousness. And here he calls it the breastplate of faith and love. Righteousness, faith, and love, they go together. You can't separate them. You need to put on the breastplate of faith and love. Faith is the inner motivation you have mm. to whatever God says you will obey. Mm. That is your heart. When God speaks, I'll do it. That is faith. Faith is activated when God speaks. Hallelujah. And it leads to obedience. Not questioning, not reasoning. Obedience. You recognize the voice of God. God says, do this. Your heart says, yes. That's your inner motivation. That's faith. Obedience, therefore, is a sign of faith. Disobedience is a sign of what? Faith. Come on, this is not rocket science. <laughs> Obedience is a sign of faith. Disobedience is a sign of lack of faith. I believe. The outward act of faith is love. Faith always works through love. Always. That's why Mark 12 says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That is faith. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not just the neighbor you like. <laughs> Every neighbor. All your neighbors. Love them. But you don't know what he does. I'm not telling you you need to love what he does. You need to love him. You need to love her. Just like that. I'm loving. Matthew 5 says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I say, Love your enemies. <laughs> love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is love, huh? This is the breastplate. The breastplate is protection. Protection is also in the things that you do, motivated by the faith that God gave you. Actions of love flowing from the faith that you put in God. Amen. So breastplate is not just I put it on and I'm protected. I, I walk like this. <laughs> No, there are things you do out of faith, out of the love that, that is God within you. John 13 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love you have. Love is key. Love is faith in action. Mm. It's faith in action. Mm. How do you wear the breastplate? By practicing your faith. How do you practice your faith? Love. Love. 
Love your neighbor. Love God above all. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How much do you love yourself? <laughs> How much do you love yourself? How much do you love yourself? Jesus. Do you love yourself? Sometimes? You desire good things for yourself? Praise God. You desire the best for yourself? Praise God. So desire the best for your neighbor. Desire the best for those who persecute you. Desire the best for your enemy. But I hate my enemy. And I have every right because David wrote in one of his psalms, Oh God, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I want to be like David. Yeah, you want to be like David when it comes to hatred, but do you also want to be like David when it comes to submission? Love is faith in action, and that is wearing the breastplate. That is what protects your heart. You walk in the ways of the Lord, how? By loving them as Christ loved them, Amen. and still loves them. Ooh. I don't pretend it to be easy. Ooh. I know it's hard. Ooh. I know when you see people living in sin, and come on. Sin is sin, but there's a difference in sin. There's a sin that you cannot see. And there's a sin that is openly displayed, disgusting, and, and God hates sin. How much do you hate sin? And you know there's a very thin line, and that's where it's so difficult. If you see a person living in sin that keeps them bound, what do you desire for them? To be saved, to be set free from what it is that binds them. Deliver. How can they be set free? Pray for them. Pray for them. All right. Look, all these things that you mentioned are true. And I would like to summarize them. Love them. Love them. Love them with a genuine love. A love that doesn't come from your own flesh. It's not the brotherly love that is the highest form of human love. It's the agape love. It's the love that comes from God because that is God. It is the Holy Spirit living in you. The Holy Spirit enables you. And this is, this is the secret, dear people. Amen. The Holy Spirit enables you to look love. at the sinner, mm. hate the sin, but love the person. Mm. Mm. Love the person. And this is, this is the most difficult thing to explain to those who are bound by sin. Mm. I don't condemn what you do. I don't condemn you. But I condemn what you do. And they will say, but I am what I do. For them, it's inseparable. That's why when you condemn what they do, they will feel rejected. Because it's their identity. But the Bible says, no, there is a distinction between who you are and what you do. The sin that you commit is not who you are. No. It's not your identity. No. Your identity, your identity as believer is Christ Jesus. He is your identity. Not your past mistakes. Not your present mistakes. Not your future mistakes. Your identity is in Christ Jesus. To reinforce your identity, you need to go into the Word of God. Amen. To reinforce that identity, you know who you are in Christ Jesus. You stand on His Word. You hold on to the truth. You know how to counter the attacks of the enemy, of the accuser. Because you have that breastplate of righteousness. Not just saying, oh God protects me. No. I can stand right before God because I'm forgiven and I walk in His ways. I live the life that God wants me to live. 
I, I live by faith. Not just that I will receive all that I need, but I live by faith by loving the people around me. Loving those that are dying without Jesus. And I love them so much that it is my main focus and priority to reach them with the love of Christ. Thank you, Lord. I spend my days in vain if I cannot reach the world that is dying without Christ. Mm -hmm. Great on. And the more you evangelize, the better protected you are. Hallelujah. That's true. Treat again. That's true. That's true. Amen. <laughs> there is no greater yes. protection yes. than to share the love of Christ. Yes. There is no greater protection to the heart than to share the love of Christ. Because you receive that love yourself and then it starts to flow. And the more it flows, the more you receive. That's true. If it doesn't flow, you don't, give up. you don't receive something new because it's already full. It needs to start flowing. Amen. That's the best. That's the best protection you have. So in short, love people. Hate sin. Love people. Hate sin. It's so simple. But it's not so simple to practice. Yes. <laughs> It takes commitment. It takes surrender. Submission. Submission. The Holy Ghost. But it will rejoice your heart when you start doing it. Yeah. Holy Ghost. Righteousness. We have been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. And that is what we celebrate today. That is why the table is prepared today. If you know that you are a child of God, not perfect, not without fault, not without mistakes, but you know that you have given your life to Jesus. Amen. You don't even have to be an official member of this church. That's why for those who join at home, you can't be here. Maybe you're not part of this church. You belong to another church, but you join our service. If you have bread, if you have wine or grape juice, you can celebrate communion today. If you know that you're a child of God. Let us close our eyes for a moment and search our own hearts. If we are convinced in our own hearts, yes, Lord, I thank you that I can stand right before you. In this very moment, there is nothing that separates me from you. There is no shadow that tries to pierce the light. All is well. And there's nothing that prevents you from sitting at the table today. But if there's anything in your heart that you know that is not right, and you can make it right with God at this moment, then lift up your cry, lift up your heart to the Lord today. As I ask Brother Joel to come and take the tray with all the cups, Pray in your heart to the Lord and ask Him to forgive you.